and yeah, that was a disclaimer to everyone. So thank you so much because we don't also want to be sued <laughs> for collecting your information without your knowledge. So it has been made, I've made that clear to everyone. Uh -huh. So we go back to the presentation I was making and that video has given us a snippet of what you are going to do today. So I'm going to introduce a company, South and Tech Company Limited, what we do and who we are. Uh, we offer services as a managed IT, uh, we offer managed IT services as a company, managed IT services and computer labs for schools, cyber security solutions, data protection as a service and digital consulting. You might be asking what all this is all about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a link on our chat so that you can assess our website and have a look at the services we offer. We'll also wish to know the clients we work with and the clients we work with as the nexus now between this managed IT services, managed IT service and computer labs for school, cyber security solutions, data protection as a service and digital consulting come, comes in in the sense that most institutions we walk into every day collect personal data, like hospitals, financial institutions, circles, educational institutions, um, like educational institutions collect sensitive data such as, let's say, some schools are, we are, when admitting children, we are required to take something as sensitive as a birth certificate. When you look at a birth certificate, what does it have? When you are born, you are issued with one. It has the name of your father, your mother, and of course your name. So we also offer managed IT services to educational institutions, private security companies, and the hospitality industry. That is it. And allow me to introduce the speaker of the day. I have the pleasure of hosting Senior. He's my senior, Mr. Laibuta. And he was also my teacher a while back at Kenya School of Law. And this is an astute and well, 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 well educated data, pro data protection uh, expert and specialist in that regard. So, um, my speaker, our speaker today, sorry, our speaker today, Mr. Bugambi Laibuta, is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, a trained mediator, a legislative counsel and policy analyst, and is also currently a PhD candidate at the University of Witwatersrand, researching and writing on privacy and data protection in Kenya. He provides consulting and advisory services in policy development, governance, rule of law, constitutionalism, privacy and data protection. Mugambi teaches legal writing and legislative dra drafting at the Kenya School of Law. And he also is also a data privacy and data protection consultant. He has carried out data protection impact assessment, which is in brackets DPIA, and drafted data protection policies and documentation for regional institutions in East and West Africa. He has carried out similar consultancy assignments for private and public sector clients in the region. Further, uh, he has drafted a data protection bill and regulations for states within the Horn of Africa. He trains institutions on their obligations in data governance and works with them to ensure compliance with universal data protection principles. In addition, Mugambi has been involved in constitutional review processes in Kenya, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, and Chile. And that is the speaker of the day that I'm honored to host. And I, I believe we all can. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone. As um, Cynthia has indicated, uh, today we want to just have um, a discussion um, um, about what this, um, which is played the, the clip from the Office of the Data Protection uh, Commissioner about the need for data controllers and data processors to register with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner and that that registration will be online. So when you look at um, Section 18 of the Data Protection Act, it says that uh, no person should act as a data controller or a data processor unless registered with the data commissioner. So it's one of the issues of uh, compliance with the Data Protection Act, but registration does not mean that one is fully, is compliant with the Data Protection Act. There are certain uh, processes, procedures that you need to keep in mind. And um, that's what we are going to, I'm going to present um, uh, today. 
So uh, maybe on the chat, you could, uh, you could let me know which industry you are from, um, so that at least as I, as, I, as I continue speaking, I can make um, some references to your, to your industry, if you're, in, if you're in legal, if you're in IT, uh, if you're in hospitality, if you're in transport, just uh, let us know on the chat, because um, uh, that will make it easier as, um, as we move along. Now, what do we need to do before registration? I think that's a question that um, a lot of us have been, um, have been asking. And um, I will start from the tail end of my presentation. Uh, so the things that really, um, so I have a checklist and this checklist is, um, it's generic. There are things that may apply to your industry. There are things that may not. But uh, whatever is on this checklist uh, would apply to almost all industries. So one of the first things that you need to think about uh, where you are in your company that you represent or organization, one is whether you have a data protection policy, and I'll, I'll let you know what this um, entails. Uh, you need to do a gap assessment and an audit report. What are the current gaps uh, in your industry relating to uh, the Data Protection Act compliance. Do you have an executive support order? For example, if you work for an organization... You can do, kindly mute them on your end because you have the host privileges, then you can... Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Okay, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, let me just start on this slide. So I say, one is whether you have a data budget for compliance, are there other resources for compliance? This is something you need to think about from the onset. Then another thing to, to, to make a list of the provisions uh, of the data that you hold, you may not be able to. Do you have a third party register, the people who process data on your behalf or the people you process data on their behalf? Do you have that third party register? How do you collect consent? How do you ensure that there's consent from data subjects? Uh, do you have privacy notices? For example, if you're an institution that provides services online, do you have an online privacy notice? Do you have a privacy notice for your employees? Do you have a cookie ban, uh, cookie ban and cookie uh, policy? Something else you need to think about here, I've talked about the employee privacy notice, because when you're complying with data protection, it's not just about your clients or your customers. You also need to protect your data in-house, the data of your employees, of your agents, the data of your consultants. So you need to give certain information to your employees about how you're going, to, what data you're collecting from them, how you're going to use it, etc. And we shall see what are the contents of the privacy notice. Another, que another question that you need to ask yourself, how do you respond to data subjects? As we will see under Section 26 of the Data Protection Act, data subjects have certain rights. So the question is, how do you respond to those? Do you have a data subjects request register? Do you have a policy on retention? Um, of data, section 39 of the Data Protection Act uh, talks about uh, retention of uh, data. Different industries will have different uh, data retention po uh, policies. Data processing agreements. If, for example, you use cloud service uh, providers, what agreement do you have with them? If you have process, uh, uh, people who process data on your behalf, do you have an agreement? Do you have a record of uh, the personal data? Uh, register, third party uh, register, ETC. Another thing you need to ask yourself, uh, when the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner uh, starts carrying out uh, audits or compliance checks, how will you be able to respond to those? Uh, do you have information security policies? I've talked about this and training and, um, uh, and training because it's much, you may collect data, but how do you pro protect it? So there's security, and security is both online security, also physical uh, security. How do you deal with the data breach response? Do you have a policy or a strategy in case there's breach? If people access to your, the personal data in your organization uh, and procedurally, how do you deal with that? Um, notification to the ODPC. Have you carried out uh, data protection impact assessments? If you have products, uh, when you look at Section 31 of the Data Protection Act, it says if there's potential for high risk uh, for the for the high risk of the fundamental rights and freedoms of the uh, data subject. 
you need to carry out a data protection impact assessment and identify how you'll mitigate uh, those risks. Do you have um, a data protection officer? Of course, Section 24 of the Data uh, Protection Act does not make it compulsory to have a DPO, but the question is, have you considered having a data protection officer? Um, do you have a working group? If you have a DPO, you need a work, the DPO will need to work with a group of people to ensure uh, compliance. If your organization is, um, the work that you do is governed by a code of conduct, for example, as lawyers, of course, we have uh, the Law Society Code of Conduct, uh, even the, <coughs> excuse me, if you, <coughs> excuse me, even the medical profession, you may have a code of conduct. If you're an auditor, auditors have a code of conduct. Are you using certifications like ISO 27001, 27701, something you need to think about? Um, do you have an information asset register? If you do have assets that uh, hold personal data, do you have a register of this? And you carry out vendor risk assessments. So in short, these are some of just the items that you need to think about compliance. And I'm sure as, um, as I go through this, you are seeing some of the issues perhaps in your organization, in the institution, where there may be a need for you maybe to improve or to have, um, to have some of those items there checked off. Now, when we are talking about the Data Protection Act, um, I'll just start with the basics. Um, we have different key actors. Um, one, of course, is the data subject, the individual who is you and I. And as, a, as I said, when you're thinking about compliance, it's not just compliance for the purposes of your customers or your clients. You also have to ensure that you put the, the same way you protect the data of your clients uh, or your customers, it's the same way you need to protect the data of your employees, of members of the board, of your consultants, of your agents. Then we'll see who is a data controller. Since at the beginning, we talked about data controllers and data processors. And as, I read, as I made reference to Section 18 of the Data Protection Act and the registration regulations, it's that you need to either uh, um, register as a data controller or a data processor or both, depending on the kind of operations that you carry out. I talked about the data protection officer, section 24 of the Data Protection uh, Act. And looking at the comments um, um, on, the, on the chat, for example, you'll find that there are some industries that I always propose that in as much as section 24 does not make it compulsory to have a DPO, if, for example, you're in the financial, uh, financial industry, if you're in fund management, real estate, uh, if you're in hospitality, there may be need for you to seriously consider having an in-house data protection officer. Uh, then, of course, we have data protection authority, and for us, that's the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And basically, those are the key actors when you're thinking about compliance. Now, when you are thinking about should you comply, Section 4 of the Data Protection Act gives us reference. It's called it's the jurisdiction clause. It tells us when the Data Protection Act uh, applies. So when you look, section, uh, look at Section 4B1, it says if you're a data controller and data processor who is established or, or resident in Kenya and processing personal data while you're in Kenya, then you must comply with the provisions of the Data Protection Act. So which means, for example, South End is registered in Kenya, established in Kenya, then, and it's processing personal data while it's in Kenya. Therefore, this means uh, South End must comply with provisions of the Data Protection Act. Then we may have institutions that uh, may not be established in Kenya or are not resident in Kenya, but they process personal data of data subjects located in Kenya. An example is like, um, Google or Facebook. Google, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or cloud service providers. They are not established in Kenya. They are not resident in Kenya, but they do process personal data of people located in Kenya. For example, you may, be, uh, you, you may have an account on Facebook or Instagram, and Instagram is not registered in Kenya, but it's processing your data. So they must comply with the provisions of the data protection, uh, provisions of the Data Protection Act.
Um, another one is the, the GDPR, and not just the GDPR, there are many other, I just use the GDPR as an example. Uh, you may be working with an institution that um, works across many ma markets. So you'll find um, just as the GDPR provides that uh, if you are processing, sorry, the GDPR is the next slide, but it had moved. So if you are processing personal data in whatever jurisdiction, you must comply with that jurisdiction. For example, Uganda has data protection laws. South Africa has the Protection of Personal Information Act. Now China has the personal uh, I think is PIPL, can't remember the full name, but it has a law, so you must comply, uh, Dubai, ETC. So you must also ask yourself, apart from complying with the Kenya Data Protection Act, you may be processing personal data of individuals in another country. And so what that means, you must also comply with the data protection laws, if they do exist, of that other country. If you look at a country like Tanzania that does not have a data protection law, uh, by and large, it would mean that uh, you do not have set out legislation that you must comply. Uh, you must comply with, but that does not mean that you use uh, people's, you process people's data in whatever manner. Because you may find that, for example, the Tanzanian constitution may have a right to privacy. Then one of the fundamental questions that uh, we need to ask ourselves, and you'll find that this, especially people who've practiced uh, uh, data protection compliance for a while, is that debate. Are you a data controller or are you a data processor? Because the data section two of the Data Protection Act says that if you're a natural person, legal person, public authority agency who determines the purpose or means of processing data, then you're a data controller. There's a convention which is called Convention 108 of the, uh, under the U U European Council, and it uses the words, makes decision. So the, purpose, the person or the institution, whether a legal, natural person, that makes the decision about how pa the personal data is going to be processed then that person is the data controller. Then the data uh, processor, of course, is the legal uh, public authority agency who processes personal data on behalf of the data controller. And this definition, when you're making a determination, because as you saw in, uh, in the registration regulations, you may, uh, you may register as a, con as a controller or a processor or both. So you'll find that many institutions will you will find that many institutions will register as both because there are time, I'll give an example. The, the best example is a principal and agent relationship. So the principal usually instruct the agent what they want the agent to do on their behalf. And the agent must comply with what the principal is telling them. But at times, the agent may also be a principal in another transaction, okay? So that's how the easiest way, especially from a legal sense, to think about a controller, processor, is that principal-agent relationship. So what this means is that once you make this determination, then you will know how to register. And of course, we also have um, the definition, a data subject. So let me give an example. I think this is something maybe I, I need to take some time. Let's look, for, look at another example. Look at South End, uh, South End. So South End may be a principal in terms of hire, maybe a data controller in terms of hiring its staff because um, South End Limited um, it has a legal officer, it has a, a CEO, it has a HR, ETC. So when it's carrying out that employment process, it's a data controller. So it's processing uh, personal data as a data controller. But Southend may also be a data processor in another way. Let's say uh, Southend is designing an IT solutions for an institution. And within that IT solution, Southend needs to collect, uh, to process personal data on behalf 
of that client. Then at that particular point, Southend is a data processor because this IT solution by Southend, it's not, it does not belong to Southend. Southend has just been contracted. And Southend is also processing personal data for that reason. So in that scenario, you see that Southend at one particular point is a data controller and Southend at a particular point is a data processor. So it's important to make those distinctions and be very clear where you fall within that spectrum. Then the data subject, of course, is uh, an identified or an identifiable natural person who is subject to personal data. So in Kenya, basically, <coughs> excuse me, in Kenya, basically, this is uh, a human being. So long as somebody is a human being and personal data relating to them may be processed, they are a data subject. Um, an identifiable natural person, you will find that within the registration regulations, there's certain data that you must, there's certain information that you must provide to the Office of the Data Protection uh, Commissioner. So when you look at the registration uh, provision, it says one of the things that you need to, to give is that, uh, so regulation five says that an application for registration of a controller or a data processor shall be informed DPR1 in the first schedule, uh, be accompanied with by registration fees. Then an application shall be accompanied by a copy of the establishment documents, particulars of the data controllers or data processors, including name and contact details, a description of the purpose for which personal data is processed, and a description of the categories of personal data being processed. So that is regulation five of the registration regulation. So you need to have to be very clear in your mind, what personal data do you process in your institution? And as you shall see um, uh, further down this uh, presentation, you need to carry out what we call uh, a data inventory for you to know the categories of data that you're processing. And categories of data could be just normal personal data, which is the information that can identify an individual. And you can identify an individual in many ways. Let's look at, for example, this webinar. Um, Southend got your name, uh, at least two, two names. Uh, perhaps it was optional, but perhaps you may have provided your uh, telephone number, or when you paid via M-Pesa, they got details, about the, the, the payment details, and of course your email. So this is personal data that can identify you. So if South End core business is carrying out webinars, when they're registering with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, they'll say, oh, by the way, we collect people's names, emails, phone numbers, uh, phone numbers, uh, MPESA details, etc. And we use this information for registering people for webinars. Um, we also have uh, what we may call um, sensitive personal data, uh, which is set out here. So sensitive personal data, as you'll see under the Data Protection Act, requires a higher level of protection. But also, but also, as you are registering with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, when you look at Regulation 5, uh, of the, reg the registration regulations. It also says about the categories of data that you are processing. So you would need to tell the data commissioner, are you, do you have normal personal data that you are uh, processing and you have sensitive personal data? And that personal sensitive personal data will include your race, health status, ethnic origin, conscious belief, genetic data, property details, marital status, names of persons, children, spouses, etc. So for example, here where we have, um, I think it was, uh, uh, we have Winnie who works uh, in fund management and real estate. So since they're talking about people's properties details, then that is sensitive personal data. And they will need to tell the data commissioner, by the way, we also process people's property details, which is sensitive personal data. For employment, we think we almost, almost half of this, for example, when Southend is employing individuals um, or when, um, when uh, Mutembe, who is in the food and beverage industry, when they're employing people, they, of course, they get to know whether that person has children, dependents, etc. 
maybe for benefits. It, so you need to tell the data commissioner whether you process sensitive personal data. And it's important to get this distinction because it's part, it's part of the registration process and it's also part of what information you need to have for you to know how to comply. Data processing, I've been talking about uh, processing a lot, uh, but I'm sure we all know processing is whatever you do with somebody's data, whether it's the collection, the recording, the organization, the storage, the retrieval, the analysis, etc. anything you do with data, destruction of data is processing. So the Data Protection Act, uh, it deals with the processing of personal data, which is anything you do to personal data. So, but there are questions you'll ask yourself in terms of compliance. How do you collect the data? How do you record the data? How do you structure your data? Do you use technology to do all this? Where do you store your data? Do you store your data in, uh, in um, physical cabinets, in files, hard copy? Do you store your data in the cloud? Where is that cloud um, uh, situated? How do you use this data? Do you disclose this data to third parties? Uh, for example, of course, uh, if you're an employer, you disclose your data to KRA, uh, personal data to KRA, uh, to NHIF, to NSSF, to SACOs, to banks for purposes of payment, uh, all these to trade unions. If you have employees who are members of trade unions, you need to share the, the, their data uh, with uh, the trade union. So these are the questions you ask. How do you do this? How do you collect? How do you record? How do you store? How do you adapt? How do you disclose? How do you disseminate? You see, also, how do you destroy? If there, is, there are instances you may need to destroy data, you need to ask yourself, how do you do that? So I just hope that brief presentation on that, you are able at least to know you have now several uh, issues that you need to start thinking about. The checklist on compliance, to the questions you need to ask yourself, how to identify whether you're a data controller or you're a data processor, and you've already started to think about what kind of data, um, what kind of data do you process within your institution? Is it sensitive data or is this just general data? Now, as data subjects, as individuals, as I say, as you saw, Section 2 of the Data Protection Act says, a data subject is um, an identified or an identifiable person. So you and I, this can be your employee, your client, um, your consultant, ETC. They have several rights. They have a right to be informed what their data is going to be used for. They have a right to access their personal data. They also have a right to portability under Section 38. They have a right to object to the processing of all or part of their data. They have a right to correction of false or misleading data. They have a right to deletion of false or misleading data. So some of the questions that you need to ask yourself in terms of compliance, do you have systems that will enable a data subject exercise their data subject rights under Section 26? Then how does, this data, how does this data subject exercise their rights? Then they can exercise their rights if it's a minor, somebody below the age of 18, by a person who has parental authority or by a guardian, uh, where somebody has mental disability by somebody who's authorized by them, or a person who is authorized uh, by the data subject through, uh, through, for example, a power of attorney, if you are somebody's legal representative, they may authorize you to, to exercise their data subject on their rights. So in summary, when you look at both the act and regulations, there are more data subject rights than are listed under section 26. Because of course, when you look at the regulations, there's a right to, to consent. You have a right to access personal data that is in possession uh, of a controller or a processor. So as a controller or processor, you, as I said, you need to think about what strategies do you have. If a data 
subject came to you and said they want access to their personal data. You need to know how to react to that. You have a right to object, a data subject has a right to object to processing of their personal data. When you are dealing with the com uh, commercial use of data, for example, direct marketing, the regulations provide, you must provide opt-in uh, opt uh, mechanisms. And even if somebody has opted in, they need to have that opportunity to opt out. They must be allowed to opt out. There's also rectification. If there are errors in the personal data that you have about me, I also have a right to come to you and say, please rectify that perhaps you captured my name wrongly. Uh, instead of calling me Mugambi Laibuta, perhaps you said Mwangi Laibuta. So I come and say, please rectify this. There's a right of erasure. But also you need to think about right of erasure um, has to be considered in terms of the circumstances. Uh, if you erase the data, how will it affect your operations? How will it affect the future, le your le future legal position? You have a right to restriction of the processing. Somebody can say, hey, stop processing my data for a certain period of time because of reason one and two. Somebody, well, a data subject also has a right to portability of their data, regulation 11 of the general regulation. Section 35 of the Data Protection Act says, you are, somebody also has a right not to uh, uh, be subjected to automated decision making. The Constitution of Kenya provides non discrimination. So, as you're processing people's data, you also should not discriminate on them. People have a right to complain, to complain to you as a controller, as a processor, and also to make complaints to the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And of course, people have a right to representation whenever they are making any complaints. Any questions so far? Before I go to the next um, subheading. We have a question in the chat box from Doris. And Doris, yes? Doris is asking, a company utilizes a HRIS system and its HR personnel manage the systems, e.g. for leave and performance management, it procured the system from a third party vendor, which entity registers as a data controller and which one registers as a data processor? Okay. Okay. Anyone who may have an answer to Doris, let's have just a brief discussion. You can just unmute yourself and speak. Anyone who has an idea? Is the data controller and the data processor there? So a question for Doris before we continue. Does the vendor from whom you bought this uh, system have any operations with the system as you use it or you just buy it and it becomes yours? You don't need uh, any troubleshooting or does the vendor handle any personal data? Okay, so yes, we, we use them for troubleshooting, maintenance, and maintenance of the system. Okay, so in terms of the, when you look at the controller processor situation, who is the decision maker? Who owns the, who owns the system? Doris, who makes the decisions about how the system is going to be used? And what personal do the company. The company, correct. So in that case, that makes the company what? Controller. Yep, and the vendor? Can the vendor act under their own instructions or they must always act on the instructions of the company? They must always act on the instructions of the company. So in that case, they are a processor. Correct, thank you. Any other question? Comment? Okay, I'm not seeing any, any other. So Julius is asking, is, um, is personal data relating to mental health sensitive data? Let's go back to the definition of sensitive data. So Julius, when you look at this slide, it says health status. Is somebody's mental um, well-being part of health status? 
Uh, yes, it is. Yep. Okay. Okay, let's carry on. Now, so that is just as that uh, with that introduction, under section 25 of the Data Protection Act, we have what we call data protection principles. These are principles that data, uh, data controllers, uh, data processors must comply with. For example, you must process data lawfully, you must process data fairly, you must be transparent. Then there's the issue what we call purpose limitation. You only use, you only process data or use data for the purpose that it was intended. Let me give an example. So Southend today has our data. We all registered for this webinar. So Southend must only use this data for purposes of this webinar. Southend cannot now go and use that data, maybe to, to give it to a third party to sell to us uh, Mashamba or mobile loans, etc. No, no, they cannot do that. Their purpose of our personal data is limited to the registration of this webinar facilitating us to attend this webinar. So that is purpose limitation. And they were open. So when you were, when you were registering for this webinar, there was a narrative there that told us, hey, we need the uh, South End will carry out a webinar about compliance for uh, controllers and processors. So for you to register, we need your following name. So they were transparent about what they are going to use the data for. And then there's data minimization. If you noted from that application portal, there's some information that was not a must. You didn't require to give. For example, there's not a must you said, uh, which I think which country you're in or your telephone number. So the only information that was necessary is the name and, uh, and your email address. And of course, you paid via We can't hear you, Mr. Laibuta. Can you hear me? I think he's probably mute or you've... Within your institution. So uh, here, so lawfulness, so one, of course, is the consent. The second one if you are is for the performance of a contract. Another one is for compliance with a legal obligation. For example, if um, Southend wants to hire, let's say, uh, let's say a PR manager, and that PR man, Southend gives a list to that PR manager and says, oh, you need to provide us the following information, your KR rating, your NSSF, NHIF. This PR manager cannot say that I will not provide you with my KRA pin. Why? Because uh, tax compliance is in the constitution and is in the tax law. And South End has an obligation to report tax, to report income. Uh, excuse me. So to that extent, South End, by demanding this data, will be complying with a legal obligation. That legal obligation will be the NHIF Act, the Income Tax Act, the NSSF Act. Okay? So you need to ask yourself, why are you processing this data? And one of the uh, provisions that you need to look at is Section 30 of the Data Protection Act. I talked about consent, and there are some simple conditions for consent. For example, one of the, I mean, one of the ways that you can show compliance is that you have obtained consent and Section 32 of the Data Protection Act says that it is the data controller and the data processor who bear the burden of proof that the data subject actually gave consent. So it's not for the data subject to say that, uh, but there I gave consent. No, it's for you as a controller or a processor to prove that you did obtain consent. This consent needs to be in plain language. Uh, the request for consent needs to be in plain language. 
I know lawyers like to, as lawyers, we love to have that long, winding, legalistic uh, wording. Uh, also, insurers love that. Also, people in the banking where you give terms and conditions that are in small print, that are in archaic language. No, it says all this should be in plain, simple language. And somebody has a right to withdraw their consent at, at any time. But also, you need to explain to someone, if they do not provide their consent, what are the consequences? Well, the example I gave of a PR manager being hired by Southern, if they say they shall not provide their KRAP in the NSSF and NHIF, then I can't hear you, Mr. Mugambi. Are you, can you hear me? It's like we've lost you again. Often may tell this person, yes, it's your right to because we cannot continue the hiring process. We mentioned that you need to give to the data subject. You need to tell them what personal data are you processing from them? Why do you need this data? And what are the consequences for not providing consent? What will you do with this data? And what are the possible risks? Who are you going to share this data with? How long are you going to keep this data? How secure will this data be in your custody? What are the rights of the data subject? So the rights of the data subject for us, you just make reference to section 26 of the Data Protection Act. And you need to provide this person with contacts for details in case of breach. So you will find it is very important to, to give your data subject this information. The data subject being your member of staff, your employee, your board member, your client, your customer, etc. Then I also talked about uh, purpose limitation. I think I've, I've dealt with this. Don't use data for the purposes it was not intended. Like as I said, now Southend cannot give, let's say, the data that we used to register here and give it to a supermarket to tell us what offer they have on Saturday. No, you can't do that. You only process data for the purpose that you told people you are collecting it for. The same way, um, it is wrong when, for example, you go to a, a restaurant and you pay for a beverage or for lunch, then they start sending you offers. Unless you had consented to those offers, they are not meant to do that in terms of the principle of purpose limitation. Accountability, I talked about how do you ensure accountability? Of course, between the data controller and the data processor, where there's a data controller, data processor uh, relationship, there needs to be a well-written agreement or a contractual obligation that sets out what is the role of the controller, what is the role of the processor. For example, the, I think that example has, the, the, ex, the question that was there about the HR, um, uh, the HR system, if the, the vendor is to have access to the personal data of the members of staff in this, it needs to be clearly stated, written in a contract. What kind of access will they have? Uh, how do they get access? Do they, need, uh, con uh, uh, do they need authorization? What does that authorization look at? ETC. Now, data sharing also, when you're transferring data out of jurisdiction, the same, you need to have uh, very clear contracts. You need to keep very good records. You will, you will find that when you look at, please note this, look at section 62.2 of the Data Protection Act. <clears throat> and this is what it says. So section 62.2, says that when the data commissioner is to decide whether to give a penal, the amount to give in a penal notice, they will look at the nature and gravity of the failure, whether the failure was intentional or negligent, any action the controller or processor has taken to mitigate distress, the degree of responsibility of the controller or the processor, any previous failures, the categories of data affected, the manner in which the infringement was made known to the commissioner, adherence to codes of conduct, organizational and technical measures that have been put in place. So you need to have impeccable records so that if the commissioner, data protection commissioner was to carry out an audit of the organization, you will have records about how you have been complying with the provisions of the data 
Protection Act. So record keeping, good record keeping helps in accountability. Also accuracy, I think I talked about accuracy. So this is um, storage limitation. I've talked about storage limitation. Now, section 41 of the Data Protection Act talks about privacy by design uh, and pros, um, privacy by design and privacy by default. So this just means that you need to embed in your systems, in your products, in your business practices, you need to have personal data considerations before you, you collect and process personal data. The issues of the policies, the privacy notices, the DPOs, the data protection impact assessment, ETC, you need to have um, a very clear uh, data inventory. Then by default, the, the uh, privacy by default, basically is that by default, you ensure that the data subject enjoys the strictest privacy rights possible. So that you do not, for example, you do not opt in data subjects to, uh, to direct marketing, to commercial marketing or direct marketing without their consent. You need to provide them the opt-in measure. So, these are questions that you ask yourself. And here, the, um, in the next slide, so privacy by default and privacy by design, you need to ask yourself certain things, which you'll find that some have already, I have already talked about. Do you process personal data only on lawful grounds? Do you adequately fulfill data subjects request? If somebody requests for um, a copy of their data, erasure of their data or correction of their data, do you deal with that? How do you ensure that all conditions for a valid data consent have been fulfilled? Can you prove that under section 32, that you have actually gotten the consent from the data subject, which is free prior and informed consent? Do you have a data retention policy? Do you carry out regular data protection impact assessment? Do you ensure that your vendors, for example, the question was asked, I think was it by Doris, I'm not sure. It was by Doris, my chat disappeared when I also disappeared. Um, how do you vet your, the vendor that provided you this HR, um, the HR system? Have you vetted them or did you vet them to ensure that they also comply with certain basic principles, cybersecurity principles, data protection principles? Because, you may be compliant, but your vendors are not compliant and your vendors have access to the personal data that you hold. And that may be where your problem uh, may be. Then also, if you're exporting your personal data to, um, to, another, to another country, is that, does that country have comparable data protection safeguards as Kenya? And do you maintain an updated and comprehensive records of your data processing at Activity so that you may be able to demonstrate, as Section 62 says, you're able to demonstrate to the Data Protection Commission or to the authority that yes, you are compliant. Um, maybe we can look at one, two questions. I go to. There is a question from Winnie, Winnie Gige. And Winnie is asking, what happens when the information that was optional was optional eventually gets disclosed? E.g. through M-Pesa payment. Um, the, the Data Protection Act, when you look at um, Section 41, um, when you're looking at uh, the issues of uh, a data breach, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 43, when you're talking about breaches, sorry, Section 43, when you're talking about data breaches, data breaches also includes disclosure of information. So where information about you, about your MPESA transaction is disclosed and it was not supposed to be disclosed, that may amount to a data breach. And depending on the scope of the data breach, uh, the Data Protection Act section 43 says, if there's a data breach, you must notify the commissioner within 72 hours. You must notify the data, uh, uh, the, the, the data, subject within a reasonable time. It doesn't define what a reasonable time is. So it also depends with to what, what caused the disclosure. Was it a breach? Did somebody hack into a system? Or did the controller or processor actually go out of your way to maybe sell this data to a third party? 
So there are a lot of questions that you may ask there, but if it is an authorized disclosure and authorized access, that amounts to a data breach which is governed by section 43 of the Data Protection Act and also the general regulations. Brian here says there are times when DPA refers to rights and fundamental freedoms. Does that refer, still refer to, to section 26 of Bureau of Rights? Now, Brian, this refers to all the rights under the Bill of Rights because when you're carrying out, for example, a data protection impact assessment, you're not only looking at the data subject rights as stated under section 26, you're also looking at other rights that may be affected. Let me give an example. How you process personal data uh, at a hospital. Let's say you're at a hospital uh, and you're processing personal uh, data and there might, if there's a breach ETC, this may have an effect on an individual's access to their health rights or reproductive rights under section 43 of the Data Protection Act. How you handle personal data of employees or trade unions could have an effect on their labor relations. So it is not just section 26, right? It's when you're carrying out a DPIA, you find out that what are other rights that may be affected by how we are processing personal data. Doris says, HR employee surveys, e.g. on survey monkey. I'm not sure what that states. Doris, please maybe ignore. Can... Please ignore. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, before you do all these things, there's what we call a readiness assessment. So I'm sure by now you have identified some of the gaps or some of the areas that in your organization as a controller or a processor or both, you need to improve on. So these are either administrative, legal, or technical. So you need to carry out an evaluation. Where are the gaps in our organization? And how will we deal with these gaps? So this is the readiness assessment. We also have a privacy impact assessment where you're trying to minimize the privacy impact risk for new projects, new processes, new policies, where you're looking at the potential problems, the potential risks that the organization, uh, so this requires, because when you carry out a privacy impact assessment, a readiness impact assessment, you may realize there are certain strategies you need to put in place, there are certain people you need to employ, there are certain privacy notices, uh, in-house data protection policies that you need to put in place to ensure compliance. Then we have the data protection impact assessment. So this is the, the, the question that Brian was asking. Um, the question that Brian was asking about what does the act talks about refers to fundamental rights and fundamental uh, freedoms. So how do you identify what fundamental rights and freedoms are being affected? You carry out a data protection impact assessment to see what are the potential risks. And when you look at section 31 of the Data Protection Act, it says that a DPIA is where processing may result in the high risk to the data subject, to the rights of freedoms of data subjects. And then when you're carrying out a DPIA, you identify what are the legitimate interests, the, what are the necessities, what are the, and the potential risks. This is where it requires your, your good judgment to determine this, is this high risk, is this low risk? And it's also subjective. What may result in high risk to one person may not be high risk to another person. So that is where when you're carrying out a data protection impact assessment, you need to ensure that you engage your stakeholders. If possible, if you are a controller, engage the, proce the processes you're working with, their employees, your employees, to ensure that you do comply. But data protection impact assessment are one of the tools that ensure accountability so that if you're not able to mitigate those risks, you make a report. If you have a challenge, if you are an, an, um, experiencing challenges to, co to mitigate those risks, then you need to give a report to the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And Section 31 and the general regulations give you guidance on how to do that. When we are thinking about compliance and accountability, one thing that we need to do is, please just look at, I'll give, just look at this wheel. I usually call it the wheel of compliance or information governance uh, from this company, Sibenko PTY Limited. 
data protection is just one of the components of complying uh, of information uh, governance compliance because data protection does not exist in isolation or does not exist in a silo there are very many other strategies that you need to put in place in terms of your program management in terms of uh, look at for example here this wheel we have one we have cyber security i think almost every organization i think many organizations these days even the small micro enterprises the small medium and micro enterprises they use technology like a smartphone for their transaction that is technology so the question is in cyber security how what is the nature of your it infrastructure how do you protect your it security how is your it security how do you protect your it infrastructure do you have it security policies procedures and processes how do you decommission technology let's say you are um, uh, you are using a version 2022 and next year you want to buy equipment that is version 2023 how do you get rid how do you destroy how do you decommission the old technology then we have privacy and data protection as part of a cog to this wheel where we are looking at the privacy framework policies procedures and processes incident response plan for data breaches uh, remediation plan if there is data breach you also need to ask yourself how is your records and information management how do you keep your records how do you archive your records both physically and online um, how do you carry out your storage and archiving there are people you'll find that the institutions for example that use third party archiving uh, professionals so that's something to think about document storage people who use cloud i think oh, i think almost everybody uses cloud service provision there are some that uh, there are some institutions that have capacity to have internal um, uh, cloud services others you have to to outsource so you need to ask yourself the question those vendors that are providing to use this service this cloud service this archiving are they also compliant with the kenyan data protection act then data governance what data policies procedures and processes do you have how do you collect you do you have a policy about how you collect your data how you analyze your data how you share your data how do you ensure data integrity and the data management is basically how you create data how you use the data how you move data how you store data within the organization in that wheel there is also their e discovery how documentation for litigation for regulatory investigations for inquiries for audits etc how do you deal with that within your organization data analytics you need you see as you are processing this data you want to also to use this data for you want to use this data to analyze to see whether you are making good business whether you are making profit whether your customer base is uh, is expanding or it's shrinking so how do you carry out your data analytics how do you detect risk and fraud how will you use this personal data that you are processing for knowledge management to develop new products and new services then risk and compliance do you have risk and compliance policies and procedure how do you detect risk and fraud and how do you de- how do you audit and assess compliance not only compliance for data protection but also cyber security records and information management e e, e discovery data analytics data governance so the purpose of this wheel i love sharing this this wheel this circle here this pie here because it helps you understand it helps me and you you and i understand that data protection does not exist in isolation it works hand in hand with other cogs of the wheel uh, or the gears the gears that push your institution uh, forward Okay, any question? There was a question there's a question here from Brian. Brian Oteno is asking what are the specific parameters for distinguishing default from design? Any example? Okay. Privacy by design is basically Okay, let me start by default. By default is the easier one. if your privacy by default is that if let's say you have an application a mobile phone application by default means that when a data subject is accessing 
that or is using that application you are ensuring you are collecting you have one you ensure that you have informed the, the there's uh, good information about what information that app is collecting you enable them to exercise their data protection rights opt in opt out you're only collecting the minimum amount of data uh, that you do require so that when this person is using that piece of technology their data protection rights the data protection principles are at a very high level so even if it is for, you want to use their data for direct marketing you have opt in so you have a, 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 a uh, an option that tells them we will wish to we will wish to use your data for direct marketing. Do you wish to opt in? If it's not by design, you will have an opt out. In as much as the Kenyan laws are at, it's an opt in, you will have opt out. And even if they opt in, you must give them opportunity to to opt out. Are we together? Then privacy by design is the whole ecosystem relating to coming up with this application. So this organization that this, that came up with this application, do they have policies? Do they have data protection policies? Do they have privacy notices? Do they have DPOs? How do they deal with the data subject access uh, request? How do they deal with security of the data? How do they deal with accuracy of the data, etc.? It's the strategies that now that company, that institution that come up with this app that ensures throughout their whole ecosystem that privacy is a priority. Okay, there's another question in the chat box and Simon Mushiri is asking, do you mean to comply with the data protection one must comply with all issues on information governance will? Um, how can I explain this? Um, I, I want to use a simple example. It's a, okay. Simon, it, it, Simon is like uh, you have a house. Let, let's say, look at your house. You've built, Simon, you've built a house. Then, of course, as you live in that house for some time, it will have problems. Then maybe one of the problems uh, after maybe five years is the roofing. It starts to leak. But you also have electrical problems. Maybe you might have some of the tiles are broken, etc. But for some reason, you don't want to deal with all these problems at once. So you say, ah, I will ignore the roofing issue. It can continue leaking, and then I'll deal with the electrical issue. So what this means is that your house is still not complete because of these challenges that uh, are being faced left, right, and center. Maybe you have a floor issue, you have a piping issue. So one thing that you need to remember, and when you look at this wheel, all these things relate to personal, when you're processing personal data, it's most probably, it's, imp it's impossible for you not to have one of the cogs of the wheel applicable. Let's look at e-discovery, for example. Regulators may come knocking at your door. And if they come knocking at your door for us, they'll be looking at, the, I mean, if they want to find you, they look at section 62, how to find you. So for example, if you didn't have good records, then you're in problems. Then also if you're an institution that is processing personal data and you don't use this data for knowledge management, um, then, then why, why really are you processing this data? Because you need this data, for example, uh, for your employees, you need to analyze, crunch that data to know uh, how old are your employees, um, how often do your employees take leave, uh, well, what is their age, how long do they stick around, how much do you pay them, how much do they expect to be paid over a certain period of time. So those insights are important for you for planning purposes. So it's okay, you know, there are people who will say, I'll ignore one of the components here, I will ignore the records and information management bit. I will not have a good archiving or a good uh, storage system. But then when you need to go and um, retrieve this data, you'll be in problems for not having a good archiving, a good disposal. Uh, let me give an example on disposal. So um, Riza, I'm sure you've read this in the paper. So there's this company that was merging with another company. It was acquiring another big company. But this big this company being bought did not decommission their technology well. So that when the company that bought them went and looked at the, this quote-unquote decommissioned technology, they realized 
that the information they got when they are buying this institution was wrong. They should have bought this company for a lower amount. How did they find that? Because this company that was being bought by this bigger company had not decommissioned their technology well. These people came and they were able to retrieve information from the quote-unquote decommissioned technology. So very important that you have all these strategies in place. Um, there's another question here by Gilbert. So is there a limit of the time an organization will retain my personal information? This, as I said, it purely depends uh, with the policy of the organization. There are different reasons where an organization may need to keep data for longer. Uh, one of them is uh, for audit purposes, for legal purposes, for regulatory purposes. It purely depends which industry you are in. So you'll find that maybe in the CBK guidelines for banks, there's a specified period of time. So you need just one look at the industry you are in, what, does, what do the policies and laws state? Okay, now let's look at the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. So the person, the institution that will come knocking at your door to ask questions, this office, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. Remember the clip that Cynthia played at the beginning? It was the, office, it was the Data Protection Commissioner giving this information when registration starts. Now, to know the role, the function of this office is under Section 8 of the Data Protection Act. And it says the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner oversees implementation and is responsible for the enforcement of the Act establishes and maintains a register of data controllers and data processors. And this is what will start uh, operating from 14th of July, as uh, the data commissioner has indicated. Exercise oversight on data processing operations, either on their own motion or at the request of a data subject. So the data commissioner can, carry, can just decide, today I'm coming up, to, I'm going to carry out um, an audit of South End technologies. And they come and they say, hey, please prove to us that you're compliant. Or it could be a complaint. Somebody could complain and say, hey, I don't like the way Southend has been processing my data. And the data commissioner comes in and carries out an audit. It also says the commissioner may promote self-regulation among uh, data controllers and data processors. This self-regulation is usually in, in different ways. It's usually in codes of conduct in terms of certification system. So you'll find like, for example, 27, uh, ISO 27001, uh, 27701 are some of the certifications that promote self-regulation. Then you have also industries that promote self-regulation, for example, like the banking industry, where we already have uh, provision. infringements of the act it may take any measures to bring provisions of this act to the knowledge of the general public so it is the office of the odpc to inform the public about their data subject rights what are the obligations the odpc may carry out inspections of public and private entities uh, it may promote international corporations etc then section 9 in terms of the powers the, um, the ODPC may conduct investigations on their own initiative or uh, on the basis of their complaint. They may facilitate conciliation, mediation, and negotiation. I'm sure, or if you have not done so, go look at uh, the complaints uh, regulations. So there are three regulations that were published at the beginning of this year. They are the general regulations, the complaints regulations, and the registration regulations. Then the ODPC may summon a witness so you may be summoned to give evidence, just the way a court of law may summon you. You may be required to give explanation or uh, assistance to the ODPC. The ODPC may issue administrative fines for if you fail to comply with the provisions of this act or if you fail 
to yeah if you fail to comply with the provisions of this act the odpc can issue can, can issue uh, fines and when well, when you will shortly we look at what uh, these fines are so when you look at the odpc the office of the data protection commissioner is a regulator is an auditor is an educator is an enforcer is a policy advisor is a negotiator is an ambassador is a consultant so all this and what we are hoping as the office of the data protection commission is setting up we hope that this office will be more proactive than reactive so that it helps so that it works with uh, controllers and processors to ensure that they are compliant not only waiting when there are, pro there are problems occur but also actively engaging the public to ensure that they also understand what their data protection rights uh, are now when you look at section 63 of the data protection act <coughs> excuse me uh, section 63 it sets out the administrative fines it says in relation to an infringement the fine may be of up to 5 million shillings or in the case of an undertaking 1% of annual turnover of the preceding year whichever is lower a lot of people may look at this you may be a large corporation and you may think 5 million shillings it's even less than what you use per, per week for tea, lunches, etc. So it's easy to pay. But then there's Section 65 of the Data Protection Act. Section 65 talks about compensation for data subjects. And it says a person who suffers damage by reason of contravention of the requirement of the Act is entitled to com compensation for the damage cost. But when you look at 64, uh, 64 it says damage includes financial loss and damage not including financial loss including distress how do you quantify distress so when you may feel that section 63 on the five million or one percentage uh, of the annual turnover it's money you can easily pay but then look at it this way sections under section 65 if the odpc will say let's say there's a breach that has affected a thousand um a thousand data uh, subjects and the odpc says for this a thousand people the compensation for each one of them will be a hundred thousand now you see your risk goes shoots up because one thousand times a hundred thousand and you, perhaps you are just thinking of ah that five million we will pay or that one uh five percent of annual turn one percent of annual turnover we can easily pay but the compensation for damages may be where the problem comes. So that is why it's very important to continually set out processes to comply with organization and technical measures. And also to remember that compliance is not an event. It is a process. And because it is a process, you need to keep good documentation, record how you are complying, so that at the event the data commissioner uh, the regulator is to come knocking at your door then you will be able to at least prove that you've done something so instead of the penalty being five million shillings they may say okay we've seen you've done something but uh, something wrong but we will fine you fifty thousand shillings but you need to work on one two three so that you don't get the maximum fine of course if you are not um, happy with the, the fine you may appeal to the high court um, the decisions of the data protection commissioner may be appealed to the high court uh, i've talked about section 65 about the compensation i've talked about uh, section 63 of the administrative uh, section 63 of the administrative fines there are also offenses so when you i'll just uh, look at section 72 of the data protection act it has several offenses it talks about a data controller who lawfully without a, a lawful excuse discloses personal data in a manner that is incompatible with the purpose for which the act has been collected commits an offense so in, apart from being a breach there was that question um i think it was by by winnie it might be this person has just disclosed information then you also may make reference to section 71 we say 
if somebody discloses personal data in a manner that is incompatible with the purpose of the act, then that's an offense. 72.2, a controller who without lawful excuse discloses personal data by the data processor without prior authority of the... Co so a processor who discloses personal data without authority of the controller also commits an offense. If you obtain, if you disclose personal data to a third party without authorization, then that is an offense. A person who offers to sell personal data, that is also an offense. So apart from the penalties, there's also section 72 that sets out uh, the offenses. And it will be interesting to see how the commissioner uh, shall be dealing with this, uh, with this Offenses. So we don't have, we don't have an example, uh, an example that has happened in Kenya about where this somebody has been prosecuted under these offenses, or some or the ODPC has carried out an audit of a certain institution and uh, handed out a penalty notice. So the, this is something that uh, we are yet to see how the commissioner uh, will act. So a business case for data protection so far as you are seeing, uh, you're reducing your legal risk for non-compliance with Article 31 of the Constitution, reducing your risk for non-compliance with the provisions of the Data Protection Act. You are reducing your reputational risk, uh, depending on which industry you are in. You're also creating an institutional data governance uh, culture. You're protecting both personal and institutional data, and you're improving your data security. Right. Any question? Any other question? We can or we can continue. Okay. So Winnie says, as a concern, citizen, the security firms that are collected our data have to go about that differently. Can one be denied entry for refusing to give info? Yes, you can't be denied entry because. Uh, the, the collection of data by these uh, security individuals, by this security firm, it's regulated by an act called Pri Private, security, Private Security Regulations Act. So the Private Security Regulations Act allows these entities to collect data for purposes of quote-unquote security at the entrance of buildings, installations, etc. But the act also says they are supposed, that act also says the private security uh, regulations act says they're supposed to use that data only for the purposes it's intended for. So the question is, do they do that? So when you read the private securities uh, regulations act and the data protection act is that they need to put in place strategies that ensure security of that data, accuracy of that data, especially the security of that data. They need to ensure that they are only collecting the information that they, that they require. So these two acts read together, then it means the security firms have now a higher responsibility on the personal data that they collect to allow us into certain buildings or certain areas. Yes, and yes, of course, you can be denied entry management, reserves, right of admission, and also the fact that there's an act of parliament that provides for collection of that data to the entry points of those buildings. Okay, uh, we can move to the next bit then. So one of the things that uh, you need to comply, remember when I read, uh, I think it was regulation five of the registration regulations. So just go look at regulation five of the registration regulations. And it says that for you to apply for registration, you need to have a copy of your establishment documents the particulars of the data controller or the data processor, including names, the details, etc., a description of the purpose for which the data is being processed, and a description of the categories of data being processed. Now, as you are registering, how do you know which categories of data that you are holding? So here is where you need to carry out what we call a data inventory. 
The challenge, one of the hardest tasks, and I think, okay, in my experience in terms of working with the controllers and processors to comply, is to come up with a comprehensive data inventory. Because of challenges of what we call a data sprawl, you find that different departments have no idea what other departments are, uh, what kind of personal data other departments are processing. But as you shall see, there is need at least to make a very good attempt to ensure that your data inventory is very accurate. And a data, data inventory is basically the list. Let's just call it a list of the personal data that you process within your institution. And when you're carrying out this data inventory, there are certain questions that you ask yourself. One, the personal data that you're processing, where does this data come from? So you need to have our data. So, so let's say, for example, you are, um, you are, uh, you are, um, let's say, for example, in a department, you are in marketing department of an institution. So you ask yourself, this personal data we are processing, where does it come from? You can say from our customers or from the general public, because for, perhaps you carry out surveys to ensure how your product is out is being considered out there. So it needs to be very clear: what personal data do you process? Where does it come from? Who are the data subjects? Are they, your, are they your employees? Are they your clients? Are they your, um, are they your agents, etc.? So this is where you ask the question, whose personal data is it? What kind of personal data is it? There was a question up there that was about mental health. You may be collecting personal data about people's mental health. So what kind of personal data will that be if you're processing that data? That is sensitive data because it is health data. So is it sensitive data? then you need to respond to the question, why are you processing this data? Let's say you are, um, you are um, a real estate company. You answer yes, why do we process this data? For land transaction under this act, under that act, we are required the following information. So we're asking people about their property details, the name of their spouses, the location of their property, their telephone number, their passport photos, etc, etc. Why? Because the law says that we cannot carry out property transactions without the following information. So there's a justification for that. Human resource department will say, we are processing these people's data because it's, it's required under the labor laws and it's required, um, it's required under the uh, income tax laws, it's required under the NSSF Act, NHIF Act. It's also required uh, as per our contract. So that is where you ask yourself, what is the lawful ground of processing? Why are you processing this data? Where do you process and store this data? Are you processing this data? Uh, are you storing it physically in some, uh, in some filing cabinets, in some filing room, or is it stored in the cloud? Like if you're a real estate company, all this information that your client gives you for this land transaction, where do you store this information? Is it in hard copy? Is it online? And if it is hard copy, how do you ensure that it is safe? Then this data, you need to know how, how long are you going to keep this data? So if you are this real estate company, you're carrying out these land transactions, how long are you going to keep this data? If there's an act of parliament that states how long a land transaction records should be maintained, you comply with that. What security measures have been, been put in place to protect this data? If you are filing cabinets, are they under lock and key? Do you have CCTV? Do you have access, uh, access control, etc.? If you are transferring this data to a processor, is there a data controller, data processor agreement in place to set out that transaction? Is the data being transferred outside Kenya? So these are some of the questions that you ask yourself when you're carrying out this data inventory. It's quite a tedious, um, an integrate process, but it's a process you need to have this, as you see, Regulation 5 says you must provide this information to the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And the fact is that a good auditor will see whether you've provided a comprehensive data inventory or not. So let's not just provide guesswork and say data one, two, three, four, and that's it. A keen eye will know that you've not provided a comprehensive data inventory. Why, do, why data inventory is key? I've said this again, it helps you craft your data protection strategy. 
because different industries will have different strategies because they have other laws that they need to comply with. That is why you, you, it will help you determine which regulations apply. It will help you in classifying your data, the sensitive data. It helps you in data minimization. If you, carried out a, if you carry out a comprehensive data inventory, sometimes you find out that you've been processing data that you don't need. So that way, you will do away, you will stop processing data that is not relevant to you. A data inventory also helps you when you're carrying out a data protection impact assessment. I've talked about the registration. It helps you also um, respond to data subject access requests. If I come and say I want a copy of my data and even don't know what data you have on me, then you may not be able to respond. It also helps um, for breach response and also for effective use of data. I know this are, it's a very brief uh, session on this data inventory. Um, it's also a process that requires quite some practice and some, uh, as I say, you need to have a first copy, second copy, as you continue refining it, so to ensure that it is as comprehensive as possible. Any question on the data inventory? Looking at it is one of the requirements for registration. Okay, Sinia, I would just like to mention something briefly. I like the fact that you've mentioned that um, the data inventory process is like, I don't want to say a tedious process, but it requires one to put in like so much work to it so that you get to do the discovery and the whole process. So when you mention that it's, it's, it, it, it's like having a whole department to deal with, then yeah, it, it, it's part that, and there's a slide I was to go back to. So it's good that Senior has been here to take us through this. And it's like, it watered down my, <laughs> my slide and it's good that senior has the benefits of experience so yeah thank you so much for yeah making this very clear you can proceed uh, i've not seen any question in the chat already concerned so you can proceed okay <clears throat> so another thing that so when, when you're when you've carried out um, this data inventory Another reason is the legitimate interest assessment. Because if you look at regulation 5.2, it says you need to give a description of the purpose for which the data is being processed. So of course you've collected, um, of course you've collected all this information here, all these that goes back to this data inventory ETC. But as you are doing that, you also need to ask yourself for you to comply with that provision, for you to tell the data commissioner, why, why you have this data. You need to continually ask yourself, why do you want to process this data? What benefit do you expect from the processing? Are there any third parties that will benefit from this processing? Are there any wider public benefits to the processing? For example, if you're carrying out health research, uh, medical research, ETC, there may be a wider benefit. How important are the benefits that you have identified? What will the impact be if you can't go ahead with the processing? What effect will it have on the data subject? What are the reasonable expectations of the data subject? Like for example, when you pay for your services via M-Pesa, your reasonable expectation is that your personal data will not be used for other reasons. So you as a controller or a processor, do you appreciate the reasonable expectations of the data subject? Are you complying with any specific data protection rules that apply to your processing? Are you complying with any other relevant law? Are you complying with industry guidelines or codes of practice? I gave the example of uh, if you're in the banking industry, you have to comply with bank the Banking Act, you have to comply with guidelines um, by the uh, Central Bank of Kenya. Are there any other ethical issues with the processing? Will this processing help you to achieve your purpose? Is the processing proportionate to that purpose? Can you achieve your purposes without processing personal data? Can you achieve the same purpose by processing less data or in a less intrusive, less obvious manner? So this legitimate interest assessment, you, you ask yourself these questions as you're carrying out, as you're doing this data inventory. Um, so I talked about the registration. So I think I've talked about um, uh, the description and purposes of processing. How do you determine that? 
I've talked about how you identify the description of the categories of data that you're processing. And if you're in these industries, canvassing for support, I mean, uh, I think here every day I get texts from MCA in my region, that I need to support them. But the question is, why is the regulator when all this is happening? Who is allowing these people to just process our data and tell us vote for this guy or that guy? So if you're canvassing for political support, compulsory registration, crime prevention and prosecution of offenders, including CCTV, if you're in the gambling industry, if you're operating an, uh, an educational institution, health and administration and provisions of patient care, hospitality industries, but this I say it excludes tour guides, if you're in property management, including selling of land, I think there's somebody here who said, sorry, I can't remember who, who said in property management, if you're providing financial services, if you're in telecommunications, uh, if you're in business that is just about direct marketing, if you're in transport, uh, if you're businesses that process genetic data, it is compulsory that you must register with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. Now, something else that I want to look at. So I hope by now you have an idea what you need to do in preparation for, um, for registration. Uh, if, you, if, you, if late, I mean, if, if that are these, you still have questions, you may contact uh, uh, Cynthia, you may contact myself, and we will together guide you on the registration process. But if you're able to do it with the, the information that I've shared, uh, well and good. Just ensure that you have as accurate information. Your information that you do provide the ODPC is as accurate as possible. Now, I talked about, so something else uh, apart from the registration, or sorry, are there any questions on that? No, I, I don't seem to see any question here in the chat. Yeah. We can, we can proceed. Okay, okay, good. So when you're dealing with data subject rights, so this is uh, other forms of compliance. So when you're dealing with the data subject rights, um, as you saw, uh, section 26 sets out what are the data subject rights. One, always verify the identity. So if, for example, today I, I go to South and I say, South and I want to know what information you have about me. One, they need to verify. Who am I? Am I acting on my own behalf or am I acting on the behalf of another person? Am I someone South End has interacted with before? Secondly, you need to understand this request. Am I asking for deletion of my data, for correction of my data? Am I asking for access of my data? Am I asking for restriction of uh, processing? Am I asking for further information? You need to understand what is this person really uh, asking? Because this request may have legal consequences to you. For example, if somebody comes to you and says, I want you to delete all my data now, you may tell them, fine, we, are, we know who you are, we have received your, um, your application for deletion of your data, and then you can tell them, okay, fine, there are several options. One, we will delete. Or two, we will delete, but we will delete part of it. Or four, three, we will not delete, we will not delete because of the following reasons. And you can say, this act says that we must keep this data, this act of parliament says we must keep this data uh, with us for a period of X number of years. So we cannot delete, or we require this data for legal, for litigation purposes, that we have cases in court that require this data, so we cannot delete this data. Or we need it for audit. Our auditors state that we need to keep our records for a period of these years, but after that, we'll be able to delete. Then you need to discover what personal data do you have. That is why the data inventory is very crucial, and the data inventory is a living document. Somebody else. So, so that's why the data inventory is very important so that you're able to know what personal data are you holding in your institution. 
So whether it is the legal department, the compliance department, whatever department it is or whatever function the organization it is, when you are aware what personal data you are holding with that, that, within that institution, then you are able to respond and consult. And here consult means please consult with your, you, know, you might be the DP, data protection officer, but you are not the legal officer. Go and consult your legal officer. Even if you are the legal officer, is also the DPO. Please consult other departments to see how you are going to deal with this data request. Ensure that you are collaborating, communicate effectively with the in-house, uh, and then inform your data subject of the decision that you make. Um, there was the question of, uh, there was the issue of the HR, um, HR, what do you call it? Uh, the, the HR, I think it's Doris who asked about the HR uh, application or system that they are using. When you are using vendors, always ask yourself, have a vendor risk assessment assessment template. This template usually incorporate it with your, um, with your procurement. It comes up with your procurement uh, policy so that whatever compliance you're asking, the same way you ask your vendors whether they have, um, whether they have uh, a tax compliance, etc, etc. So now with the registration starting, one of the things that you may need to ask some of your vendors is, are they registered with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner? Are they compliant with the provisions of the Data Protection Act? Uh, do they have a data protection officer? Do they have data protection policies? Do they have a security policies? All these things that your institution must comply with, you must also ask your vendors their need to comply. Then you need to ask yourself which, ven which of your vendors handle personal data. Do they, are, they, are these vendors handling critical aspects of the... Of if your vendors are, uh, are, the, are cloud service providers and your only storage is cloud service, then that is critical aspect to your company. Do you have vendor contracts? And do those contracts critic, uh, specifically lay out what are the duties, obligations of both the data, con of, those, of both the vendor and yourself? And then you need to continually review your vendor compliance. So while you are doing this, you need to have an inventory of all your vendors that are handling data, have a vendor rating and scores, know which vendors have a high rating in terms of compliance with the provisions of the Data Protection Act. For example, you could say, if a vendor is not registered with the ODPC, their rating goes down. You need to continually assess, assess their risk and you need to collaborate with your vendors and stakeholders because issues, for example, like uh, breach, could be caused by a vendor who is a processor or could come from the, you, you as a data controller could cause problems to your processor. So you need to collaborate as you are doing this vendor risk assessment. Then the next thing is the document analysis. You will find there are a lot of documents that are contracts, ETC, agreements, ETC, in-house external documentation, terms and conditions. Look at all your in-house and external documents. Identify whether there are data subjects in those documents. Identify who the data controller is. And I say it is very important. So let me give you an example. So um, a few weeks ago, um, so a f last month, and not, not a lot of certification. This is in, in terms of the role under Section 8 to, to encourage uh, self-regulation. So some of the certification you may think about is 27001, which now extends to 27701 on uh, privacy information management uh, requirements and guidelines. If you are doing uh, direct marketing, if you're involved in the direct marketing, one thing that you must do is that uh, you, I, I've talked about this already, section 37, you must have obtained uh, express consent from the data subject. If not, um, you, may, you may, so there must be express consent. The regulations say there must be uh, opt out where somebody has opted in, there should also be opt-out uh, procedures. Now, I just remember there's something that I forgot for us to do. It's a brief exercise and it's very important. 
So, look at this slide. Think about your department. Think about your company and think about one department, whether legal or whatever. I want you to come up with a simple data inventory. And that simple data inventory, I want you just to say, I want you to do several things. One, you, I want you to say, what personal data do you process in your department? Where, do, who, where do, does that personal data come from? And whether it's, it's sensitive personal data or it's just normal sensitive data. So I think we can do that for uh, three, five minutes. I hope it's clear. Yes, yes, this is a good activity. Let's, yeah. let's, 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 let's get up and, yeah. I know we've been seated for like three hours. Sorry, or it's my network, that's a problem. But just take what you say and repeat. Yes, please. So on the on the personal data, that would be ID number. I'll use the ID number. And then uh, it comes from the customer. And uh, it is uh, it contains sensitive data. And uh, we process it for KYC purposes, to conduct KYC. And then uh, the lawful background of processing is uh, when we're onboarding, we need to do a background to ensure that uh, it is genuine, so we will use. No, no, just unmute yourself and share. And by the way, the, the, the data inventory is best done when you, when you think about it, when you draft it like Njenga has done, then you realize when he goes back to it, he'll realize the other issues that he may need to add or amend. So it's best done with a lot of practice. Could we have one more? Sorry, can you hear me? Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm not audible. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Senior. Okay. Okay, as you think about... Uh, It's like we've lost you again. I, we can't hear you. I can't hear you personally. I don't know if the, the audience can hear you. Maybe you can, guys, you can comment in the chat box so that we know if, if, if I'm the only one who is not able to hear you. But yeah, I'll get a t-shirt from South End. And Apollo one. So yeah, good. Let me post the question. You'll answer at the chat box. So nope. take time to think through your question. It's not as easy as you might see it. So don't rush to answer the question because it looks simple. But as you answer the question, have in mind. I think I think I'm back. Um I don't know, today's safari com is horrible. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear you, Sidia. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Let me give you the host presentation. So we will get back to our questions and I will give us like three minutes to answer each question when we get there. So let's conclude with our speaker first, then we can jump right back to the questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, very loud and clear. I hope it doesn't drop again. Sorry for that. Um, minimum standard for dealing with data protection that is quite high. Then you may transfer data to another APSA bank because you know their level of uh, data protection is um, high. If, for example, for public interest, for judicial principle uh, proceedings, and for the legitimate interests, for example, COVID data that was that is continually being shared. Now, when you are cutting out, before you transfer data to another, uh, to a data, 
before you, you share data outside jurisdiction, there are several things that you need to assess. You need to assess the, the kind of personal data that you'll be transferring, the categories of personal data, whether they'll also include the sensitive personal data, the types of entities involved in the transfer, are they and so here is where you also carry out some form of vendor analysis. You need to think about the sector in which the transfer is occurring, the purpose of the transfer, the format of the data, are you sending the data whether it's uh, pseudonymized, when it's encrypted, encrypted? Are you sending it in hard copy? Are you sending it via email? Via... So all this, a shared folder, the method of transfer, the technological and organizational security, the importer of the data has put in place to protect the data, whether the data will be stored outside Kenya and whether there's remote access to that data. Uh, the movement of the data, how does it move? and uh, the possibility of the data being forwarded by the importer to another uh, entity. Then you ask yourself, does this, in the transfer risk assessment, you ask yourself, does the transfer comply with the Data Protection Act? If no, what tools of transfer are you using? Uh, what, what are the circumstances and details of the transfer? Are, the what, are there safeguards in the destination? Is there possibility of harm? And is there protection against third party access? So transfer risk assessment. So you'll find that in, in a lot of these um, compliance strategies, they, they are all, there's always an assessment to be carried out. And you have to ensure that you carry out a very in-depth assessment and have a report, and have a report, record that report, also record that you have carried out um, a transfer risk assessment so that um, you're able to, uh, to comply with the principle of accountability. An in-house, um, if, you're, if you're coming up with an in-house policy, because in-house, one of the ways that you need to comply, that will help you to comply, is helping, is having an in-house policy that detect, dictates to the board, dictates to management, dictates to member of staff, your data sources, your basis for collection or processing personal data, the personal data that you, uh, you you are collecting your, pro how do you collect data? How do you process it? How do you store the data? How do you ensure accuracy in your organization? How do you ensure data security? Um, how, how is it, what is your data retention policy? How do you handle complaints within the organization? How does the data protection officer uh, operate uh, in relation to other officers in the organization? How do you carry out communication relating to data protection? Who and why and how do you allow third party access? How do you conduct data prote protection impact assessment in your organization? How do you deal with non-compliance of a member of the board, a member of staff, a board member of management, employee, agents, obligations, data transfer? So these are just bullet points. They're not uh, exhaustive. There are many more components that may be there in a privacy policy, but an in-house privacy policy is like a, a HR manual. See the way in every organization you have a HR manual that says how you dress, how to get sleep days, sick days. Um, if somebody is harassing other employees, if somebody comes to work drunk under the influence, if somebody is, is uh, eligible for promotion, that kind of thing. So you have a manual that is an in-house privacy policy that gives the same kind of, how do you deal with disciplinary issues relating to, uh, to data protection? So all this require, needs to be in your in-house privacy policy. Then um, remember at the beginning, I talked about a privacy notice, the customer facing. Uh, this is just the info. If you remember this, I had a slide on the information that you give your customer. And not only your customer also, you also, privacy notices, you realize you'll have very many of those. You'll have one for your customer, one for your employees. You may need one for your board, one for your management, because the data that you process for each of these category of individuals may be different. So in the privacy notice, you're telling people what data are you collecting from them. You are telling them how you collect that uh, data, how you are going to use that data, how you are going to store the data, how you are going to keep that data safe, um, whether you share your personal data with, with, with their personal data with third parties. You need to remind them what their data protection rights under Section 26 are how they are to contact your organization and how they may contact the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. 
Um, something else for emphasis, it's important, as I said, you need to have very good record keeping. Keep records about the people you train on data protection, uh, the, the different versions or revised versions of your data policies, your privacy notices, have good records, how you appointed your data protection officers, what are their TORs, what are their deliverables, ETC. Good record of inventory of personal data processed, uh, the reasons for processing personal data, an inventory of the third party with whom the personal data is shared, strategies about to ensure correctness of data and security of data, have a good record of the complaints, how you deal with those complaints, request by a data subject, and a good record keeping of any data breaches even when they occur. For the DPO, I think I talked briefly about the DPO, the section 24 says that uh, a data controller or a data processor may uh, appoint my, my advice is always that certain institutions, if you're, in, if you're in hospitality, if you're in banking, if you're in a SACO, in insurance, it is, you must designate a DPO. But for smaller SMEs, you may, the act allows you to use external DPOs, which is also allowed. So as a DPO, uh, your role is to advise the, the controller or data processors, the employees, the board, and you have to ensure as a DPO, a DPO should be part of senior management, just like the internal auditor is a senior management. At no particular point should the DPO be a junior officer. It should always be senior management. And a DPO should be making reports either to a committee of the board or to the board directly. <coughs> Excuse me. So the DPO ensures uh, compliance, all these things that I've been talking about, the team leader, the person who spearheads this compliance process, of course, is the, is the DPO. But the DPO also works with the, what you call a committee. Uh, so where you find that, uh, so there needs to be a data governance committee or a data protection committee, whatever name we'll give it, where the DPO is the chairperson, and then there are members from other organizational functions and departments. And this governance committee, uh, its terms of reference are basically to meet regularly and review the process, um, the progress of data compliance within the organization and to support the DPO. They may also meet on ad hoc basis in the case of uh, issues arising. They promote the culture of good governance within the organization, within their functions, within their departments. And of course, they provide advice for the DPO when a decision needs to be made. So the DPO is not to act in isolation. The DPO needs to be facilitated with resources needs to have this committee that, um, so this, for example, this uh, data governance committee could have the DP, could have, I mean, it has the DPO, it has somebody from finance, it has somebody from HR, it has somebody from ICT, uh, it has somebody from legal, and any other risk and, com it has somebody else from, uh, somebody from risk and compliance. So you'll see all these individuals and this expertise when they come together to review the progress. That wheel that I, I showed you, they are able to bring the expertise and their knowledge base to that wheel of information governance to ensure proper compliance, not only with data protection principles, but also with um, uh, data analysis, uh, etc. Et um, in terms of uh, security controls, uh, you need to pay attention to the nature and scope and purposes of your data processing. Different security control, different industries have different security controls. So think about your industry and think about what are the best practices around security and controls. Also think about the cost of implementation of these security controls. If there is to be a breach, uh, the first thing that you need to do is contain the breach. Once you've contained the breach, or as you contain the breach, assess the breach. Um, assess uh, the, the breach severity risk assessment. Has, been, has any risk been occasioned or has the damage been occasioned? Uh, notify the data protection commissioner within 72 hours as required and the data subject within a reasonable time. And then of course, review, uh, review your, security, uh, your security controls. So look at section uh, 43 uh, and also the general regulations, the guide on uh, data breaches. Uh, regulation 37 of the general regulation uh, talks about the categories of notifiable data breaches. I find it a bit difficult because it gives a list of the kind of data that you need to pay attention to. 
And I think in terms of practicality, this will be extremely problematic. But let's wait and see. But as you are, the data breach, as the communication that you have to make, of course, you need to describe the nature of the data breach, describe the measures that you've put in place or you intend to put in place, uh, recommend measures to be taken by the data subject just in case there any damage has been occasioned upon them. If possible, identify the people who uh, caused the data breach, name and contact of uh, DPO ETC. And uh, when you're dealing with data breaches, the strategy, always have an inventory of your risk at risk assets. So one of, of course, when you look at it this way, an, an asset register is important, even not for data protection, but you need um, an asset, you need an assets register that sets out what are, what are your assets that hold personal data or that facilitate processing of personal data. Review your data, consumer protection and data laws to ensure compliance. Have an incident response stakeholders like that committee, the, the, that company governance committee that has DPO, ICT, legal, finance, ETC. Assign roles and responsibilities for everyone. Seek external adv advice where necessary. Carry out practice drills. Always document uh, if a breach occurs and always learn from the data breach. Thank you. So I hope, um, I mean, it's just uh, two and a half hours of um, uh, uh, some of the strategies, but I hope with these strategies that at least you are able for your organization to ensure that um, you've complied as much as, uh, as much as possible. And that also, and most important uh, for the next month or so that you are ready with the requisite information and documentation uh, to register with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. Thank you very much. Wow, that was a great presentation, Senia, and I hope we've all learned something, and I believe that it has given you a renewed emphasis on organizational accountability, and you realize that uh, this presents to us, uh, or it rather demands a proactive and robust privacy governance uh, strategy. So as we start the compliance journey, we, I hope I will work with some of you or most of you as we walk this journey and start. So I want us to move to our questions. And yes, this is the first question. You'll respond in the chat. And that is the first question. We have like three minutes to answer this. So the question is, what are the three requirements of the Data Protection Act regarding processing of data? So meanwhile, you can answer that. Simon Mushiri is asking, are we going to get the slides? We are going to share with you this via emails for the participants. So we don't really worry about this. Regarding the certificate, this is what I have to say. We are going to email you so that you let us know how you want your certificates to look like, what your certificate, and it will be a, a soft copy certificate, so it will be sent via email before Friday, that is. So if anyone wouldn't have received an email asking whether uh, they should, how, they, how their names should appear, then kindly reach out. Thirdly. So I've posted the first question. I'm going to post the second one and the third one. Then we can pick a winner and we know you let us know how we let you know how you pick your t-shirt as well. And then we can call it a day. Thank you for your patience. You've been a very good audience. Uh, that one I must recommend and say that. Thank you, you've been a good audience following up, asking questions very, at least it's not been like a monologue all along. We've had a great conversation around data controllers and data processors, and we hope to have more conversations. You can still engage us, you can still engage Mugambi Laibuta on the processes and requirements and everything. We also do trainings for board members, for staff on data protection. 
also reach out for that. We also offer cyber security as a service and we offer endpoint solutions at South End Tech. Endpoint solutions are software and hardware that uh, is meant to safeguard your data. Yes. The second question is this. I'm going to post it so I don't... You guys are not interested in t-shirts, but you can also raise your hands and give the answers, provided you don't have to like type there. You can raise your hand and yeah, there's, Doris has answered. Oh, I already have a winner for the first question. Congratulations, Doris. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Doris. It's low. It should, the, the data, the, the, three, the three requirements of Data Protection Act regarding processing is it should be fairly collected, lawfully, and transparently. Thank you, Doris. On to our second question. Second question, there we go. What legislations and regulations exist in Kenya regarding data protection and security? So legislations and regulations, begin to note, to note that. I'm posting the third question, which is also simple, not so hard. There's a question here, someone is asking. Okay. I'll ask Senior to respond to this, Mr. Mugambi. We have a question from Sandra Nzile. Sandra is asking, is it not compulsory to have a DPO? It is, it is, okay. I don't know if it's a question or a statement, but this is how it comes out. It is not compulsory to have a DPO, so. No, no, it's, it's, it's not compulsory. I think there's, there's, there's a question here from Willie. Where can a group of companies create overarching policies and procedures, but with individual observance? Um, maybe Winnie can explain that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting that. Um, then I think there's also the question on, um, you know, uh, under Section 24, of course, it's not, the, the Act uses the word may to have a DPO. But in some companies, in some industries, as I stated, you cannot survive without an in house DPO. And as much as the Act says may, and because of the word may, uh, the regulator the, the regulator may perhaps uh, not come hard on you, down hard on you on that. But it's important for terms of, for example, you can't be a bank without a DPO. Uh, you can't be an insurance company without a DPO. It really doesn't make sense. But as I stated, some organizations use uh, external counsel. External counsel like myself, I act as a DPO for, an, for more than one institution. So that is also possible. But if you appoint a DPO, that DPO must be senior management. It will not work if that DPO is not senior management. That is a fact. Uh, you may ignore it from the beginning, but you'll find challenges this DPO acting um, a few days uh, down the road. Um, thank you, Mr. Mugambi. This is Winnie. Mm -hmm. To clarify on my first question, um, where I work, um some the companies in which i'm engaged fall under an a group of companies so there's the main company that has various subsidiary sub subsidiaries mostly wholly owned now for many of our internal processes or okay for many of our policies they are formed under the main group of companies like the main institution they're under that name but each of the companies um, observe the policies individually. I don't know how to put it, but for example, company X with company Y and Z, the HR policy, for example, is in the name of company X, but Y and Z observe it. Um, rather than X, Y coming up with theirs, Z coming up with theirs, A coming up with theirs, because it will just lead to replication because it's a small company, but just there are many, like the staff are interconnected. It's just really, yeah, the nature of the companies that I work with. So I'm, I'm wondering whether the data protection policies and procedures can also be in that, can also be formulated in that sense, because it is clear to me that many of our subsidiaries will have to, 
will have to observe this and register separately as controllers, especially, or processors. But can we have an overarching policy under the under company X, in the name of company X, that companies Y and Z observe, but for the inventories and all those compliance processes, the assessments, all those, they're in the name of that company, in, in the name of the small, in the name of the subsidiary, so to speak. I don't know if that makes sense. That's just the structure we've chosen. In ah. yeah. yeah. Yes, actually, um, in terms of, uh, so sometimes they're called, you can call them binding corporate rules, where you have a group of companies, um, I mean, those subsidiaries, ETC, using the same data protection principle. So that is possible to have one of a racking in-house policy. Uh, but all these subsidiaries also have to sign up into that, um, those corporate rules or that corporate policy, that combined corporate policy. But in the, since this, I'm assuming these subsidiary companies also have uh, the different rules, you'll find that they'll have different, as much as they may have the same in-house privacy policy, they may have different uh, privacy notices depending on exactly what work they carry out or what operations they carry out. And exactly. it's also possible, it's also sorry. possible for the, sorry, it's also possible for the group of companies to have one uh, overall DPO. Oh, thank you for clarifying that as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm not seeing any other question in the chat box. Uh, what I'm seeing are the responses to the questions I asked. And for number one, Doris answered the question correctly. Number two, we have Julius. Julius gave me, this is what Julius is saying, the data protection, general regulation of 2021, the data protection registration of data controllers and processors regulations of 2021. And we have the data protection complaints handling. So Julius, you are almost close. You are missing one. <laughs> but I think I'd give you the benefit of doubt you've, you've tried. Regarding number one, Winnie also answered and Winnie stated that data should be legally obtained. That is right for a specific purpose. That is okay. Data shall not be used for purposes outside in the matter specified. She's also right. So I, I was, I, I'd said that you are going to go on a first come first basis. So for number one, we have Doris. Number two, we have Julius, but you didn't give me all the answers. You're still lacking one. We have three regulations and we have one legislation. So you left out the most basic. Yeah. Then Brian gave us DPA 2019 general regulation. Processors and controllers, complaints, regulation, you are missing two. Try next time. Alex, DPA 2019, that is just the act alone, which is the legislation. You are missing three more. The third question was, what are the three principles of information security to ensure data protection? Um, Victor said CIA. Victor was the first one. The answer at 1637, CIA in full means confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So for question three, we have Victor and Yatich. Yes, I think that was great. Thank you for the participation, the interaction, the questions, very insightful. And I hope to host you and see you again next time. Welcome and thank you so much, Senia, for your time, for the great presentation, insightful and like making this i know it was too much content within a short period of time but it has made us understand what we what to expect as we start the compliance journey so i believe we can call it a day any further concerns or questions kindly reach out to me in person or to mr bugambi laibuta or to our company through our website so thank you so much we can call it a day. Parting shot, I'll say data privacy safe cyber. So have a great day. Be a data ambassador, be a cyber security ambassador. Bye bye. Thank you. Th thank you too. Thank you, Cynthia, for arranging this. It was a, it was a great session. Welcome. Welcome, Cynthia. <laughs>